you know um so. i don't think it's a problem just like let it be known that we're recording this kind of well in advance of when it's going to air because we're doing it after watching all of the house of usher right so yes but it's is, also a general Poe appreciation episode, which... And it'll go in January. It's just in the context of when we're recording, I'm getting to suspect that I've uh, created a monster here. I think that Mike just wants us to turn into like a horror podcast now. Because <laughs> yeah, we, no. did, we do a month of, of monster stuff, which, uh, hey, even I was getting tired of it by the end. Uh, and oh. then we roll right into November and it's just all end of the you know, world and death and apocalypse stuff i mean like uh and, and hey now we're gonna do some post and then, stuff hey, and then you know what is winter is very fitting for kind of like that bottom of the uh of the story it's like the descent into the underworld too so we'll have to do a bunch of dark stuff during winter or december too so yeah it's just constant life is pain jacob haven't you learned yeah i think that's the <laughs> that's the big take for our, for our listeners anyway Welcome to The Voyage Podcast, a show that traverses the oceans of myth and legend through the lens of Catholic theology and philosophy. Come aboard as we set sail in pursuit of the heroic life and Christian virtue with your hosts, Mike Schramm and Jacob Platty. So, yeah, I guess um, since you've pulled back the veil once again, we'll... This is this will be airing uh, the week of January nineteenth, which marks Edgar Allan Poe's two hundred twenty fifth birthday, and mm-hmm. so this has actually been on our schedule for for quite a while now. But we also noticed that uh, back in October, I think it was like end of September, or maybe it was the first week of October, uh, Netflix released the Mike Flanagan Fall of the House of Usher. Yeah, which the the miniseries. So there's not going to be a season two of this. So it's it's all this self contained, you know, one you know, story. Life's life's little blessings. <laughs> okay, well, so there's a yeah tipping your hand <laughs> a little bit too. Um, but anyway, so we're gonna so this is a general Poe appreciation episode, but also a specific review of the Netflix limited series Fall of the House of, Fall of the House of Usher uh, as well. Think we can fit both of those in in uh, an hour, Jacob? I think so. I mean, I have a lot to say about Poe. Uh, you know, I've been trying to get a little bit more involved with the uh, outlines a little bit, or at least having a bit of better balance of it. And uh, so I added a bunch. To it's because you don't trust but... me. It's because you don't trust me. That's all right. You can say it. I, I I'm just, uh, you know, I'm trying to bring a little bit of depth uh, to the shenanigans. You know, one of us might as well. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so, well, welcome, welcome you guys to this episode of the Voyage Podcast. If that's not enough of an introduction, hopefully, you know, when you see the on the analytics where the the numbers go down, we'll see at the two and a half minute mark when um, <laughs> that's when it'll be like, oh, that's enough for me. Right. Right. Not quite two and a half, two minutes mark, but uh, so we're gonna just kind of go through um, just sort of some general stuff. Uh, why do we like Edgar Allan Poe? Not just you and me, but just in general, why has he had such a big impact in the last? 200 ish years and then um specifically what did we like about the fall of the house of usher series and then what did we not like and that'll kind of take us to the end so why don't we go ahead and just do a little bit of background jacob if if you don't mind oh sure you know um well actually i kind of thought that we would start with uh you know as is our wants um you know what's your relationship to to edgar Allan poe and like pop culture right um, okay. obviously he's an author, obviously he's a yeah. poet. Um, he's written some of my favorite poetry. I really do like Edgar Allan Poe quite a bit, um, mm. which is kind of cliche for someone like I was gonna me. say, it's very on brand for you. Yeah, exactly. You know what? Well, you know, gonna, I also, <laughs> well, I wear big <laughs> trench coats and outliner. You're very based. Yeah, when I'm not Jacob's... doing this podcast. So, uh, you know, I have a Raven patch on my backpack. So, um, <laughs> I assumed that was a Harry Potter reference, but, uh, I no. bought it at Hot Topic. So. It's that's legit. I. You could have given me one guess of where, and I would have guessed it right. So you didn't even uh, need to tell me that. I'm just making all that up. I don't wear eyeliner. <laughs> um, that's got to be well. Now that we're video, uh, yeah, yeah, we can't even we can't even joke about that being the case anymore. I really so. do like Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe a lot, though. Um, did you know I actually had like half uh, the Raven memorized? 
um, back in Again, high school. Not surprised. I feel like you may have mentioned that to me though, too. Uh, you didn't use your house of memory method, unfortunately. Or I did your, not. Uh, and that's why I only got halfway through it. And, um, I don't know. I probably of don't. Of memory is what that was. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of something, gen- something gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Is some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Merely this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December. See, this is January. I'm glad this is I'm glad this is public domain. Because uh, <laughs> we'd be getting in trouble then. So if you want to read... So if you, this will be, that, it's a nice wintry our, poem. That's for the uh, Voyage Premium listeners. They can listen yeah, to the entire dude, if poem. He has, I'm going to do Jacob. a full recital. You heard it her... Hear, why can't I talk today? Wow, I am tongue-tied today. You heard it here first... Proper enunciation is key for reciting Edgar Allan Poe. Um, it won't be you, live when you do it, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah. It won't be a live stream. I will do a full recital of The Raven in all of my oratory glory just for listeners of this podcast and How anyone else who shows up. Exactly. So you know. did you want, I guess, did you want to go through like, did you have like a favorite or something or like a favorite short story? Or you just um, well, mean, you know, like, there was actually, what TV shows have you seen it in? There was, all right. When it comes to like my favorite Poe, like TV shows or, or, um, movies, I guess. I don't really know any TV shows per se. Uh, Poefinaria, f- yeah. uh Poefinaria. Well, the very on. first Treehouse of Horror did a rendition of the Raven or Bart Simpson's okay. the Raven. That's the sure. only TV thing that comes to mind. Um, but See, uh, actually, the Simpsons also did a Telltale Heart, uh, where remember when they they destroyed oh, yeah. that science or the diorama? The, yep, and then it's um, coming from the the yeah. Floorboard. That's true. He shows that up. one actually. That's the the one that comes to my mind for a Simpsons poem. Really, reference. there's just such a dearth of uh, television material related to Poe, and then Mike Flanagan comes along and and gets my hopes up. <laughs> and then he delivers what he delivers us. Um, but, and I say that as a true fan of Mike Flanagan's work, he's done a lot of really good stuff. But uh, there's a bunch of movies from the 60s that were put out by American International. And they were like in the same era as like the Hammer horror films. And so you have The Fall of the House of Usher. Or if you guys want to watch some really good Fall of the House of Usher material, Go to that movie. <laughs> it might not be for everyone. It's kind of old fashioned by today's standards. But they were basically um, America's answer to what like uh, Hammer Horror Studios were doing over in Britain. But uh, those are my favorite. Those are my favorite like Poe adaptations. Is those old sixty movies? But uh, there's some new ones too. Like they did the Raven. Oh, John Cusack. Yeah, John Cusack. That guy. He played Edgar Allan Poe. He okay. was a Helping to like solve murders, kind of like um, based upon his stories. Did you ever see yeah. that one? Um, no, I haven't. Uh, but that uh, does remind me of. It's not so, a very good one, anyways. <laughs> well, so um, so there's an novel by Matthew Pearl where so he actually Is that does the one Dante on Dante Club. Well, the Dante so there's Club, the right? Dante Club, but there's he wrote one ab- about Edgar Allan Poe with the similar kind of what mm. you were describing in that movie. But I know he has one on Edgar Allan Poe as well. But yeah, there's also the. Uh, there was the Fox TV series, which was only two seasons, called The Following. And that oh, was... Oh, yeah. Um, I remember James, that. Hey, James I, Portnoy. Or no, what was his name? James Portnoy, I think, I think. Or, oh, well... It has Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon. I mean, Kevin Bacon's the, yeah, the biggest Kevin Bacon's the, big, yeah, the main guy. But, um, My but wife yeah, the following. loved that show. She I thought season one was really show. good. Yeah. Season one was really well done. And then season two, I mean, because it got canceled after season two, but I think it's yeah. because it sort of fell off afterwards. Uh-huh. Um, no, that was that was actually clever. Everything that was Purifoy, a clever show. James Purifoy. Mm, okay, but anyway, um, so that yep. yeah, so that was another like the, the whole first season was, you know, you had this um literature professor who focused on Edgar Allan Poe, uh, and then he had built up this following, and and they kind of they one of the characters is like a specialist in cults, so there mm-hmm. again, that's sort of part of it, but uh, their people his his followers are committing all these murders and stuff. And so Kevin Bacon has to like kind of solve the, solve the riddle or solve the mystery and catch the bad guy. Well, uh, I got to give a shout out to, um, the pale blue eye, which was also on Netflix. This is a movie that Netflix produced. It's fantastic. I was a little side eye about it because the description of it is, um, you know, 
a private detective has to go solve grisly murders at West Point, where a young student by the name of Edgar Allan Poe will assist him in sleuthing Ooh. it out or something like that. And it's like, that sounds cheesy. Like, all right, you're going to use Edgar Allan, like a, a young teenage Edgar Allan Poe as like a little yeah. like crime detect junior crime detective solving murders at West Point. Um, I was like, I'm hey, sold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they yeah. got your number. Yep. That's that young adult market. Um, got me. Yeah. YA fiction. Um, but uh, no, it was actually way better than I ever thought it would be. Really okay. good. Highly recommend it. Um, I don't know the actor's name who played Edgar Allan Poe. He's fantastic in it. And um, the main isn't it? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It, well, Christian, Bale's the main, Christian Bale's the main character. He plays the, like I, the private detective guy. I think he's the guy who plays Dudley in uh, Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. He's really good in the Pale Blue Eye. He's a great okay. young Edgar Allan Poe. So definitely check it out if anyone hasn't seen that one yet. That's on my um, watch list, and I haven't gotten around to it. But maybe uh, with your recommendation, I'll have to um, finally get to it. All right. That's not sarcastic. That's no. I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before, so. because here's the thing is I, I want to, you know, talk more about the actual man and his stories and all that. And then we can get into, I feel like the second half of this episode will be us uh, politely discussing Mike sure. Flanagan's Fall of the House of Usher. So, uh, you know, I grew up reading this guy. I mm. I think that it really was kind of a, ooh, a girl and Poe, he's like, a spooky writer from back in the mm. day. And so like back in like the sixth grade or something like that, fifth or sixth grade, I think I probably discovered him and was just like, Ooh, I like this. This is cool. This is, yeah. That was back when I really was wearing eye makeup. Scary just stories kidding. to keep you up at night sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. That's, Scary I mean, stories that's, to tell that's in the sort dark. Of like your, I love that stuff. That's, that's like the, your, that's like you're in, but there's, as we're going to kind of talk about, there's so much more to, I mean, Edgar Allan Poe than that. Like, there's a reason why he still continues to resonate, not just because people like Halloween. Because there, I mean, you well, can read it outside of Halloween and it's still valuable. One of the things about Poe is the tragedy is that like he was one of those guys that like wasn't appreciated in his own time. Like he had mm. like a modest following, but he didn't like get the um, notoriety in his lifetime that he has today. So, uh, and I don't quite know. One of these days, I should read like read up on it some more like how did he perhaps just like the following that he did had just continue to grow i guess mm. um because now he's famous right he's up there with like mark twain or herman melville yeah, in terms or whatever, of in terms you know? of american examples i mean he's got to be yeah. in like the mount rushmore of american like yeah know, liter- i would literary authors or whatever those early you know nathaniel hawthorne Edgar poe herman melville you know um Mark Twain, right? Like an important voice in American fiction. And, uh, but no, and he died poor. He died really mysteriously. If you want to know mm-hmm. why he died so mysteriously? Go watch that movie, The Raven. It'll give you a really good answer as to why he <laughs> died mysteriously. Um, but yeah, they actually just found him like on a bench dead one morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's been a while since I looked into like his biography. I, I think the assumption is that it was like opium addiction or something like that. Mm. I think that he kind of, you know, had a, had an addictive it's, personality and got the best of them in the end. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of the slow slow suicide of yeah that kind of pharmacological I guess you know not to put to too too thematic of a I I do well, think that's why I actually do think that's why they used the pharmaceutical industry for fall of the house of usher. I it's think also it's, kind of topical, it's but yeah, to, it's fitting. Yeah. I thought, no, it I is. thought it was I clever. It, like, you know, like there's you know, clever part things two of in this the show. Yeah. Is going to be what did we like about it? We have to do that first. We're going to do a compliment sandwich, Jacob. That's just right. So that we can. So that's, no, that's there right. were there were things that we enjoyed, or even if it was somewhat mm-hmm. tainted, you know, like well, we'll get into that. But anyway, yeah. um, no, he's somebody who, yeah, you you come in for the for the for the scares or for the kind of like sensationalist aspects of his stories but they continue to stick with you they they continue to resonate because there's so much depth to them right there's so much more before below the floorboards so to speak than what you can kind of you know see well, in front of you i think i think that he was just a very very honest writer like that he had mm-hmm. a lot of he had a 
pretty distinct theory of art, so to speak, about what he was writing. Mm. And he just really believed in the craft in the act of like writing for the sake of writing and just telling a good story. Um, I think mm. that he's somebody who he would agree with like Tolkien, for example, to like, you know, hit that bingo card. Uh, so where check that off the list, right yeah. um he he didn't have any time for like allegory or anything like that he just thought that like storytelling should just be good storytelling um mm-hmm. it's kind of funny because i've been reading through stephen king's it and uh there's a writer as a main character um in that book and he has a flashback to being in college and they're in college and the students are all like digging into all these stories and you can tell this really feels like an autobiographical note for Stephen King. I was going to say, yeah, when a writer puts a writer in a story, it's I know exactly. (laughs) And so he's talking about this college experience or remembering the characters, remembering this college experience where you have all these people who are like finding all of these themes in the books they're reading and, and you know, all this postmodernism and all this kind of like breaking down of stuff. And his character's like, can't you just like tell a good story for the sake of telling a good story? And um, the professor, like, you know, gives him an F and like, you know, oh, you suck or whatever. And that's terrible. You so know. sophomoric. So yeah, yeah. yeah so juvenile yeah. and all that stuff, you uh-huh. know. Um, and so that got really because Stephen King is obviously one of the most popular writers of all time. And he's at his best when it's it's not kind of like moralizing when, or hacking. When he's it's, not heavy handed. When he's not. I mean, not we're all, in, we're, <laughs> yeah, we all we're all tempted to that or we'll, we can all fall victim to that sometimes too. and this is also going to be a theme of when we talk about yeah. the house of usher yeah. Yeah. um but I, and so that's fun which actually things. if if nothing else that betrays poe more than anything it else. does like that's, no it that's does. less offensive to us as christians and more offensive to poe as as an oh yeah that, because you know i think that poe was at least moderately christian i think that he was um a person well, who lived in a christian world at least yeah, Christian um, Catholic sensibilities, actually, which we can kind of get into as well. But um, yeah, but anyway. um, you know, I'm not saying that his fiction is uh, it's definitely not Dracula, right? It's definitely not mm. like, you know, if you go and you read um, whatever, Descent into the Maelstrom or something like that, the Fall of House of Usher or something, um, you know, it'll be tangentially Christian. It'll be of a Christian culture and things like that. Um, but yeah, you know, it's mostly just storytelling for the sake of storytelling. But Poe really believed in this because he belonged to an era that was rapidly um, modernizing in that kind mm-hmm. of like sense that we talk about it, where um, the magic was getting sucked out of the world and everything was turning into this type of hyper-rationalism. And in response to that, you have the romantic movement that arises in the you know late 18th, early 19th century, in, in which like they kind of just walk away from the whole conversation about like what is true from like a scientific materialist perspective and really just kind of like focus on what is beautiful. It's it's sort of a, so yeah, it's like an overcorrection to the utilitarianism that we both are of course very critical of. You can overcorrect mm. it to this sort of like hyper romantic movement that we sometimes see in, not yep. just in, in literature, but also in like the visual arts and things like that too. And so in one sense, you understand it, right? We're you and I are just as critical of this utilitarianism, even though that's not necessarily the perfect response or the perfect answer. But you know, it when it swings the pendulum back and forth, you you try to hopefully you know, like Aristotle, hit that golden mean somewhere in the mm-hmm. middle of this this kind of virtuous like path. And this will get into um, what you kind of have and and uh, later on in our line, you have truth is beauty is good is truth. This convertibility of well, trans- yeah, the there's this reaction because here's what, like I you know I know that this is like podcast suicide, but I actually do want to quote some things that Poe um, wrote because uh, I I won't be able to do it justice paraphrasing it. and it's worth and I won't quote too much of it. You just said like it, the first like five stanzas of the Raven, so I think uh, <laughs> I think we're past that point. <laughs> We've, Never more. we've not only knocked at that chamber now. door, but we've busted right on. Through, yeah, right. So uh, well, um, anyway, as something's you were. tapping at the lettuce. Let us see what then they're at is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. No, before I even start quoting that stuff, like uh, there's just some like things that need to be said. Is is the the romantics? They just like stopped caring about truth. 
Like that just wasn't, it just wasn't their bag, baby. And um, so, and, and they kind of looked their nose down at all this kind of like uh, unmagical, unenchanted modernism that was taking over everything and kind of overcorrected, like you said. And I, you know, as Christians, we don't, we don't have that false dichotomy, right? Like mm-hmm. beauty is truth is, is goodness. There are just three facets of like our experience of God transcendentally through you know the world that we live in um as as he reveals himself to us like in creation things like that um uh poe he actually wrote out his little treatise on like what he thought of literature what he thought of um you know his opinion about writing things like that so we don't really have to guess you know where poe's head was at on this um, this was an essay called The Poetic Principle, and it was published posthumously after his death. Um, he died in 1849, and he was going around trying to raise funds because he wanted to start a literary magazine um, and to like culture and develop um, like the next generation of writers because he wanted to like show the world that America could produce like great literature, things like that. Mm. He, he was a classicist. You know, if you listen to him write, his vocabulary is insane. You know, he's got an old mm. fashioned way of talking, even by like early 19th century standards. You know, he's mm. very flowery in his language and things like that. Uh, and he wanted to bring more of that to the table and kind of like stand up to like the European snobbery of his time about like this upstart American, you know, people without a culture kind of thing you know and he's like mm-hmm. oh we can have a culture we can create beauty and things like that and uh he died um as he was starting to get that enterprise underway uh but he wrote some uh speeches that got turned into this essay and this is how we know what poe thought about and so mm-hmm. here's where i'll start quoting some stuff uh in enforcing truth and again truth is uh what Poe of the early 19th century, he's saying truth, but he's using it in the, basically what we'd understand as scientific rationality. Like right? scientism, yeah. yeah. Yeah, scientism. That's what he means by truth in this context. In enforcing a truth, we need severity rather than the efflorescence of language. We must be simple, precise, terse. We must be cool, calm, unimpassioned. In a word, we must be in that mood which, as nearly as possible, is the exact converse of the poetical. And when he says poetical, he is actually really talking about what we kind of refer to as like mythic on this podcast anyway, the kind mm. of mythic or the mythopoeic or, or, you know, the enchanted, right? Like he's going to use this language of poetical, but he means that kind of mythic sensibility that we talk a lot about on this show. Well, he's addressing the dichotomy, but he's, he's not, he's not accepting it. He's saying like, that's the very problem is the false dichotomy. Well, and you can tell, I'm you know, I'm not just spouting bull when I say, when he uses the word truth and he says, we must be simple, precise, terse, calm, unimpassioned. He's talking about scientific analysis, right? Like, Mm. uh, so it's the exact converse of the poetical. He must be blind, indeed, he who does not perceive the radical and chasmal differences between the truthful and the poetical modes of inculcation. Uh, You know, journalism versus storytelling, basically. Like Mm -hmm. he says, there's a radical chasm between what we've talked about in times past, like the Gospels are not a journalistic enterprise. They talk about real events. They talk about things that actually happens, but they're not written from a sense of... Uh, you know, what Poe would call the quote unquote truthful, we think they're truthful, mm. but like he's, you know, they're not scientific. They are poetical, as Poe would say it. They are mythic, as we would say it. And yeah, to say, I mean, just to kind of, because we we kind of do our uh, Not Another Hero on His Journey, our, our episodes two and three, where we kind of go through all this. And it's not even saying like it's historical versus poetic. It's yes, it's both and. It's that by calling it purely or just historical, you're actually limiting the power and the importance and ultimately it's at least historical it's at least historical but it's much more than that you know yeah um you know so you know just to skip down he says i would define in brief poetry of words as the rhythmical creation of beauty Hmm. its sole arbiter is taste it has no concern whatsoever either with duty which I think he's talking about like moralizing, like Mm. propagandizing, you know, Mm. 
putting stuff into things, like trying to like send a story with a message kind of stuff. It has no concern whatsoever with duty or with truth. And again, he's talking about like scientific veracity. We don't tell stories because like, you know, if you want to find out facts, go like read a dictionary, you know, and if you want to um, get a, a lesson about how to live, go, you know, talk to your priest or something, you know, like um, he, that's just not where Poe's head's at when he mm-hmm. can, when it comes to storytelling for Poe. Right. I think that he overdoes it. I, mm-hmm. I like uh, the Chronicles of Narnia just as much as I like Lord of the Rings. Well, maybe not just as much. But, no, I was going to say, not just yeah, as much. Not just as the, much. But yeah, I like the Chronicles of Narnia. They have their place. You know? and, and honestly, but there's a reason why those are like catered more towards younger audiences than the Lord of the Rings were. Mm-hmm. Not just because, it's because developmentally, that is what's going to resonate more with a elementary or upper elementary grade kid is going to be the more allegorical or, or um, directly allegorical. Whereas, you know, drawing out some of those um, beautiful, true things without the direct one-to-one, like this person is this, this thing is this, that's something that, you know, as you go up developmentally, you're able, you're just able to do better. It's not even mm-hmm. a, a question of better or worse. It's just a one's, you know, it's, it's receiving something, it's, it's teaching something in the mode of the receiver, which is a, a, a Thomistic principle when it comes to, basically everything about theology is that God is condescending to our level to mm-hmm. communicate to us something, whether it's something um, true in the written word of God or the Bible or the um, oral tradition or in the communicating himself in the person of Jesus is that it's a condescension of coming down to our level because that's the mode of us, the receiver. And well, it's so kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the explain something at, at five levels, like those yeah. videos you've seen those before. So you got to speak to someone like a kindergartner, then you got to explain the same thing to someone who's like, whatever, a fourth grader, say the same thing to someone who's a teenager, say the same thing to someone who's an adult, and then say the same thing to someone who's like a PhD specialist in that field, you know, kind of thing, Mm -hmm. Uh, which I haven't really watched any of those, but it's a, it's a fascinating concept. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, for us, it's like, we, God has to do that with all truth (laughs) for us, right? Mm -hmm. And ironically, we're still more at like, you know, the kindergarten or maybe the fourth grade level when it comes to this stuff. And we think that we're so smart and we understand so much about, you know, theology or God or something like that. But it's all condescension, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, really, even when it's just like the substance of whatever thing we're talking about, it's like we can only know the the substance of of a rock by looking at this rock and this rock and this rock and this rock. So it's like, it still is a condescension from this abstract idea of rockness to kind of get mm-hmm. a little platonic to now we're kind of going into the Aristotelian of now you have to, in order to know the genus rock, you have to look at this rock and this rock and this rock and see what do they all share. And so that still is, yeah, like you said, a condescension. Um, even when it is, even if, like you said, you're a five-year-old or you're a professional geologist. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. And, you know, I I threw, I have a few more quotes. I think we'll read one more, then I'll save one for the end. But, like, uh, it's not that Poe is just completely ambivalent towards, um, you know, truth or veracity or anything like that. So he, he has another quote. It by no means follows, however, that the incitements of passion or the precepts of duty or even the lessons of truth may not be introduced into a poem, and with advantage, for they may serve incidentally in various ways the general purposes of the work. But the true artist will always contrive to tone them down in proper subjection to that beauty which is the atmosphere and the real essence of the poem. And I want to point out the ironic reality that this is Edgar Allan Poe talking, because Mm -hmm. people do not associate Edgar Allan Poe with someone who is pursuing darkness, beauty. pain, nobody Yeah, he's, he's the that's gothic, all, you know, he's he the is, emo, yeah. he's the emo kid of the, you know, 19th the proto, century. The proto-emo. Yeah. The... yeah, exactly, right? Proto-emo, um, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and, but, you know, I don't think that Poe saw, I think that he did have, like, a morbid bent. I, I do. But I also think mm-hmm. that he had it from a more classical position where it's like, it was like a memento mori type thing. And I think mm-hmm. that he thought that the uncanny or the weird you know, were really, really positive things to write about or that he was very interested in himself because I think that brought to him a sense of reenchantment 
like what we mm-hmm. talk a lot about. You know, it, it shakes you out of that. It shakes you loose. It shakes mm-hmm. loose that um, mundane. You know, the the mundanity. I guess the mundane reality that we sometimes um, limit ourselves to. And so, yeah, when you're presented with the macabre or the weird or the just sometimes grotesque, it does shake you loose. Yeah, you know, it's the light shines in the darkness, right? So if if Mm -hmm. Poe, he writes dark stories, it's so that the light can shine, right? Like uh, it's, it's there to, like you said, shake us up and open our hearts, basically. Uh, I honestly do think that's what Poe thought he was doing why he was writing those stories. I don't think that it was, um, you know, just because he was just like super gruesome, dude. Um, Mm. He was reactionary in that regards to like the kind of modern enlightenment principles of his time. I don't Um, think it's, um, I I don't think it's live. And I don't think the website is, is like still going, like you can find the old, like archived um, examples of it. But if you Google search, keep Catholicism weird, it'll lead you to a website called weirdcatholic.com. And it tries to gather all of these, like, and, and I mean, it's part of our, it's part of the, the tradition. Like some stuff is from recent, some stuff is from a long time ago, but it's going right along with what you said, which is, you know, some people are really leaning into, and I think for good reason that, and I, I even say this to my students, like, y- you're not wrong to think Catholicism was weird. In fact, you should think it's weird because it's it's supposed to kind of shake you loose from the the everyday. It's supposed to say that it's supposed to point you beyond the reality that you can just see in front of you. So it's like the keep Portland weird t-shirts, but it's keep Catholicism <laughs> weird. Right. Yeah, so it's yeah. Kind no, of I, I I say that sympathetically. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's if anything, that's why I'm Eastern Orthodox. Is like we're like Catholics, only weirder. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you're did like, you know we that did we kept it weird? <laughs> this yeah, this is a, there's a very short. You know, he has a poem because I have my works of Edgar Allan Poe, yeah, anthology? Dorset edition, right? Um, he's got a really short poem called Catholic Hymn. It says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it because it's really short, actually. At morn, at noon, at twilight dim, Maria, thou hast heard my hymn. In joy and woe, in good and ill, Mother of God, be with me still. When the hours flew brightly by, and not a cloud obscured the sky, my soul, lest it should truant be, thy grace did guide to thine in thee. Now when storms of fate o'ercast, darkly my present and my past, let my future radiant shine with sweet hopes of thee and thine see there you go guys we're not Beautiful. making this stuff up no Edgar Allan Poe so, tell us about his Catholic that, stuff yeah you t- tell me so something so the about two this. things so that's actually the I was going to bring up that he has a, a Marian devotion which as you illustrated in that that hymn or that poem that he wrote so that's always the thing that comes up um, but also, so he spent a lot of time in, in upstate New York, or that's kind of where he lived. I mean, I know he's kind of in the Baltimore area as well, but he spent mm-hmm. a lot of time in, in New York. And, um, so he actually was on the campus of Fordham university in mm-hmm. New York, which is run by the society of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And so he had a lot of kind of informal spiritual counsel, um, and was all, spent a lot of time on the grounds, a lot of time, um, in the chapel or, or around that area, you know, who can say what he, what he was praying or, or what his, you know, what was going on in his heart. But, um, he, he never like formally converted to Catholicism. Maybe he was baptized as a child. I can't remember that part of his biography, uh, which again, like you said, he had this general Christian upbringing or he had this general Christian milieu that he was a part of. So yeah, maybe none, he none had of a lot his of his writing those... is like anti Christ. Right. No. I mean, it's some, it deals with madness, it deals with like some pretty gruesome stuff. Right. But, uh, it's, it's simpatico. I, you know, yeah. Sometimes I have to give disclaimers for some of the stuff we talk about on this show. It's like, hey, this is like not a Christian movie, right? <laughs> but like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you don't really need a disclaimer with Poe. Like, he's not going, to, I mean, hey, he might be a little bit like, you know. So he kind of reminds me of, you, um, if you can remember, all the way back in October when we were talking about uh, Bram Stoker and Dracula, where he was one of those where he had that very strong Catholic sensibility for whatever reason, right? Whether it's mm-hmm. the characters he puts in Dracula, um, you know, we even talked about his his life and how he was married to a devout Catholic. And so there's a, there's a little bit of speculation around that. So it's a similar sort of thing with, with Edgar Allan Poe, where he had a lot of these Catholic sensibilities. Um but it wasn't something where, like I said, you're not going to find his name on a parish registry or on a, um, you know, confirmation slash chrismation list or anything like that. But it's more like um, 
uh, the the spirit of the law as opposed to the letter, where he had mm. so much of this where we can even see, even in his non not explicitly religious writings, it has a lot of these things that would resonate with the Catholic sensibility, even if it's nothing more than just a recognition of the the reality of evil, the recognition of, like you said, memento mori, which is it's not a replacement for for grace or, you know, but it's almost like a it's an actual grace that can move you to supernatural grace Hmm. that remembering your death can help you along that path to your need for God and your need for, you know, the sacraments and the church and all that stuff. Sure. So that's, I mean, like I said, I didn't want to oversell it. Like that's kind of as far as it goes. It's not something where, you know, he has in some letter, Oh, I just wish I could convert, but uh, it's nothing like, (laughs) it's not like, you know, there's not going to be a slam dunk sort of, it's not a baptism by desire, so to speak. But, uh, but anyway, that's that's sort of the extent of, and then like you like you said in in um, one of his works too. I mean, Marian devotion goes a long way, even from the the um, visible bonds of the church, like even outside, so to speak, you know, the visible parameters of the church. Sure, the love of Jesus's mother, like you know, you and I aren't going to sneeze at that by any means. No, no, it's it's more impressive than most Protestants would have done. Uh, back in those days of, you know, the American century and things like that. Um, so he was already an outsider, I guess. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) He was was like, that was just him doubling down on being an outsider. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to love That was the cool emo thing to do. That was the cool emo thing to do back then. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's it's like historic Christianity is pretty metal. So no, (laughs) let's, let's get into, uh, I was about to say, uh, shall we actually get into the house of Usher episode series? Please, Yeah. I've been dying to talk about it. I've been dying to. So Uh, let's just, let's say, what did we like about the series first? What did you like? Um, okay. Uh, listen, I can say aesthetically it's really well shot. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there's a lot of, legit cinematography i think that there's a lot of good acting i think that it's a well polished piece of art right like they did a good Mm -hmm. job executing on it um and the you know this is still the same like this is the round table cast of characters that mike flanagan has used in like all of his projects that i've watched Mm -hmm. except you know he did dr sleep which is a really good movie actually i enjoyed dr sleep uh but it doesn't have all those these Netflix shows, they always use the same people, more or less. It's like he's like the Adam Sandler of uh, horror movies, where That's he uses right. the same. His, That's right. Yeah, his same, yeah, his same <laughs> cast. He's, I'm sure that's a that's a great uh, comparison that people exactly. left. Uh, he's um, like Adam Sandler. Happy Mad. This is the Happy Madison uh, Edgar Allan mm-hmm. Poe story. So uh, I'm a I'm a sucker for attempts yeah, to kind of unify. <laughs> the or synthesize all these different things so like obviously poe never shows up in it but the idea that you're taking all of these disconnected short stories or disconnected symbols or images from all of poe's works and you're integrating them all together into one big story like i'm i'm always going to give that at least some like you know like you're you're really it's a monumental task to try to do something like that and so whenever somebody's trying to to unify or synthesize I'm already sort of interested because I think that's just such a cool concept. You know, I'm and, not gonna lie. I I thought that's what he was going to do when I heard about what the show was going to be. Mm-hmm. But I'm gonna quibble with you on. Well, okay. We'll wait. We'll wait. You sound like you had more positive things to say, Mike. Why don't we continue down that positive sandwich? <laughs> I mean, I. Sure. I, I only had three, but uh, the other one was, I mean, I'm sure, you know, and everybody loves, uh, you know, Mark Hamill's character. I think that was just, a, yeah, actually, yeah, like a fun great. surprise. Mark Hamill's was like character a fun, was great. Yeah. It was a fun surprise. And he was just a very kind of, I don't know, enigmatic or magnetic character. You just, it's like, it was like, I mean, yeah, he's, he's just, he's, a he's Mark Hamill for a reason. He's, he's yeah. watchable, but yeah. He's super watchable. Uh, he's like the wolf from Pulp Fiction. Um, he's just like the person that gets called in to like fix a problem. And he's this mysterious person who just, you never doubt that he's capable of achieving what he needs to achieve, blah, blah, Mm -hmm. blah. He does a good job in the role. It's a fun role in this context of this show. I do think that there might be something kind of poignant in like the, his, almost his final scene. So he has, when he's, um, if you remember, he like catches death. Or I guess we'll just call her death for we this should point. say we should give a brief synopsis of this show as such. Yeah. Um maybe. here, why don't you you go ahead, you give the okay. brief synopsis. So so basically you have um this the the head of the, the patriarch of the Usher family calls in this 
seem like you think you don't know if he's an investigator reporter or whatever, but he's going to like tell his story. So you already know that you've jumped ahead. Like a bunch of stuff has already happened, but then every subsequent episode is sort of like him telling the story and it's sort of like flashbacks. Oh, and a and bunch of stuff being cool. all of his children are dead. <laughs> well, this is, this so, is not a spoiler. This is the very first episode. Like yep. it, they're at the funeral at for funeral. his six yep. dead children. Um, and well, it's only three at first. Three. Well, yeah. yeah. But it's immediately, right. it's like all six of my children are dead and I'm going to tell it's like you, you're gonna t- I'm going to confess. He's, and he says, yeah, this is, I'm going to tell you how it's my fault or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, so he's going through it and, um, you get, not only do you get flashbacks to like the immediate present or like the immediate past of what's just happened in the last, like seemingly couple week weeks. or so, yeah, 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 a couple of weeks, but you also get flashbacks to about 30, no, probably 40, 50 years ago now. Is it the 70s? It was the early 80s. It, it was the early eight. Well, yeah, okay. like late 70s because there's like like the first like five years of their ascent, basically. So it starts in yeah. the late seventies and it gets into the and all the way back to, to his and his sister's childhood too. But that's that's There's some bigger flashback. Brief, brief childhood moments, yeah. Yeah. So um and and it's giving you so that's the rise of the House of Usher, but we're all seeing the fall where mm. but you also see the reasons why, right? The seeds that have been planted as to why this family is falling apart. And not just, you know, physically in the sense that people are dying, but spiritually in the sense that this unity, all this unity is being broken, right? And maybe it was a facade. I mean, that's kind of, you know, what you find out. But he's he's going through episode by episode, and each one sort of focuses on a different kid, right? In terms yeah. of like that, it's almost like in the first frame, you're like, oh, it's that's like a kid that's going to die. Each kid is a brick. Well, yeah, that's exactly how it is. It's, it's um. And every episode ends with like a stamp, uh, the fall of the House of Usher, right? And it's always immediately following the death of one of these children. And they're not kids, kids. They're all adults. But like, um, except for maybe the first one. He's like a teenager, 18 maybe, 19. And, and Lenore, the granddaughter too. And Lenore, yeah. Um, Who's probably like 17, but yeah, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, yeah, so basically it's a, he's a pharmaceutical magnet, you know, CEO. It's a brother-sister duo um roderick and madeline usher those names are taken mm-hmm. from the story uh and they are kings of the world on top of this uh pharmaceutical company throne and you know ziggurat if you will mm, uh and nice. uh yep yeah. and uh it's about this mysterious woman um verna who uh is kind of haunting their relatives and them and slowly killing them off one by one um and that's the basic just this show. I mean, we're not. There's like no spoilers here, right? Like, the show's been out for and a plus, couple months. I was going to say by the aired. time, yeah, by the time this airs, it'll have been out for for mm-hmm. a while. So, um, so if I thought that it was like very, very good, I'd be way more hesitant about spoiling it. But <laughs> spoiler alert: I don't think this is very, very good. So I don't really yeah. care about spoiling it. Um, you know, it. So Verna, her name, she's the Raven, right? Her mm-hmm. her name's a anagram for Raven Verna. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, um, but she's death, yeah. and death is Which, stalking these people. It's so funny that we had just recorded the, our death episode. I know, I know. We just did a episode. we just did a death episode not that long ago. A personification of well, it'll have been aired all the way back in November. But I know well, that's we have just not that long ago, even by the time this airs. And then by and then yeah, we fi- we both watched this like probably within what the first month that it comes out, mm-hmm. and. It's like, oh, this would have been oh. perfect for our death. But yeah, uh, it we get, could have talked you know, about death her gets its own death episode, episode here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so. we'll do a second. I don't know. We'll do a. No, um... we we're not going to do another one on this. <laughs> that's for sure. So I'm not Yo, watching yeah, it not again. On this one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, and. So she's death following them, which we've talked to go back to our death episode. But she's uh-huh. it's death following them. And it's very mysterious because nobody knows who it is. Like, because yeah, they don't never, she never shows up. And then, yeah, um, Roderick and, and Madeline don't even recognize it right away for various reasons, too. Again, like Which you said, is, very cinematically done, too. It's but. it's ironic because I am reading it at the same time watching this. There's another similar storytelling element where, like, the kids in that book don't remember. Like, they grow up, and as adults, they don't remember anything about their, like, traumatic past. And so there's mm-hmm. almost this sense that, like, uh, Roderick and Madeline Usher don't remember making a deal with death because it ultimately it's revealed that's what they did. And so not only is she death, but she almost has like a devil vibe going on. Like they made a deal yeah. with the devil. 
But Mike Flanagan is like an atheist. He like he's an interest from a Catholic perspective. He's an interesting story in of itself. He he was raised Catholic. He was an altar boy, um, and then he had a crisis of faith. And now a lot of his stuff um, deals with being post Christian, right? It's so like, if you watch yeah, his TV like show Midnight Mass, he raises a lot of like questions about the role of religion in in life right and really in his life and things like that he really it's, wrestles with it it's not yeah, in this it's like one. a traumatic not like, in this I guess, one. sort of healing with it yeah no yeah, this, this is, is him the going cheapest. beyond yeah this is him beyond like i don't that stuff's stupid now is well that's the thing you know honestly i wouldn't be so down on this if i didn't know how good some of his other stuff is one of my favorite tv shows of all time of all time is the haunting of hill house which was hmm. his big break on Netflix. It is a fantastic series. I think it's like 10 episodes. It might be 12. I don't know. Um, but talk about great storytelling and talk about storytelling that it doesn't really have an agenda. It's just a hmm. really, really good story. So to give Edgar Allan Poe his due, I think that Edgar Allan Poe would love um, The Haunting of Hill House, right? Hmm. Which is just about family and tragedy and you know how we're haunted by the past and things like that. Uh, is oh. very Poe-esque, right? And I thought tradition, that Flanagan was going to... follows you around. Yeah, well, I... That's I a zombie that episode. This was the person that was going to go and bring a bunch of... Because that was the shtick, right? Um, he's doing haunted house shows. So Hill House is a famous Shirley Jackson story. And then this follow-up to that was The Haunting of Blind Manor, which was a take on The Turn of the Screw, which is another famous kind of haunted house story. And then it's like hmm. The Follow the House of Usher, which is... It's not so much a ghost story, though it is kind of a ghost story, but it's more well, that's like what a, we'll kind of get into. That's a, that is one of the, the positives about this show, I will say. Mm. Is um, that it's kind of like uh, you you kind of said it was like the Babadook, where it's like you're not sure if it's quote unquote real or if it's psychological, or is it kind of a little bit of both? Which I was asking myself that as I watched the um how follow the House of Usher too, is that you get the sense that she's like a real quote unquote physical presence. Yeah, but there's also this element of are the only people who see her the ushers, and so is there the psychological element too, which mm. comes back to this very real like because even when they when they make that deal with the devil deal with death they walk out of the bar and they turn around and it's like a boarded up you know like right. nothing's been there for years so yeah um you know I would say that like I never felt like there wasn't some kind of like apparition haunting these people mm -hmm. i think that what i was saying was that it's it feels like at times it's going for what the babadook was trying to do which is mm -hmm. like you know bend the sense of what's real and what's a mental illness or whatever and conflate the two and things like that mm -hmm. uh, and i think the show does try to go for that sometimes but i think that it doesn't do as good of a job as like the babadook does does um but uh you know he has a history. Mike Flanagan has a history of doing really, really cool, good, exciting TV. Um, you know, none of them, none of them has been as good as Hill House, in my opinion. I would say number two is probably Midnight Mass, right? Where you mm. know, even as an atheist, someone who's rejected religion and who had some angry years, years where he was angry at religion, um, you mm. know, he admits this, right? in his mature years his later years he's started to kind of like whatever just think about it you know meditate upon it it's become midnight more mass. reflective yeah more yeah reflective. midnight mass is him just kind of meditating on religion and society and things like that and so even though it's coming from an atheistic perspective and ultimately i think we like just don't agree um it's still an interesting tv show it's an effective story it doesn't feel like it's, you know, it's talking about religion, but it honestly doesn't feel like it's like excoriating religion. It's, mm. it's talking about religion as like a genuinely human impulse. And so as such, even though I know it's written by someone who doesn't agree with me and, and doesn't, you know, support my belief in God, right? It's still, mm. it's, uh, it's a respectful meditation. I can watch it and I can enjoy it. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like number two behind Hill House. Um, Bly Manor is just kind of If bad. we don't get through the stuff we like about it, you're not going to have any chance to say what you don't like, Jacob. Yeah, so, I know. Yeah. Well, 
So yeah. I did want to say the one thing I liked about you, you talked about how Mark Hamill's character is like the fixer. And um, what I thought was interesting is on the, in the last episode, death offers him that same deal of you can get away with this. You can do the very same thing that your employers did that the, um, that the uh, ushers did. And he says, no, he says no. And so he yeah. breaks the cycle and what it makes it super, doing? makes him such a more compelling character too. Because he's he not just a lets, bad guy. Yeah. He also lets justice be done because then he gets arrested and actually goes through like in a sense, mm-hmm. him, him allowing for justice is breaking that cycle of death. And so I, I was like, is he the hero? Like, is he the hero character yeah, kinda. in this story? I, I do mean, think he's like, that's what's so, that's what is so cool about. I mean, like, he's a like, very was, interesting cool character. Thing. I think that he is ultimately, um, nihilistic. I mm-hmm. think that he is kind of the hero, kind of a hero anyway, because in like this story, yeah. what in this story, what he says is, you know, I've lived my entire life without anyone having leverage over me. And I'm not going to start now because basically, mm-hmm. you know, death comes to him and she's like, Hey, uh, you know, the ushers are going to go down, but you don't have to, I can arrange for you to get away with all the bad stuff you've done and you're not going to get in trouble for it or you'll go to prison. And he's like, I've lived my whole life without having leverage held over me. I believe you. I appreciate the offer, but you know, I'm just going to abide by the choices I've made and play the hand that I, that I've got kind of thing. And just walks Mm -hmm. away as a man with his own sense of like, integrity he's, right? he's so invictus he, he's invictus at the end of it right yeah um that being said that comes right after he's all like you know humanity is a virus <laughs> in mm. other words he's like this kind of like ultimate realist character i mm. think he's the type of character that a, a materialist atheist he's the type of hero a materialist atheist writes yeah. right like it's like I'm not going to give in to anything that especially I don't some believe quote unquote supernatural force. Yeah, I I I'll take the wallops I got coming to me because I lived my life my way. You know, to you mm. know quote the Frank Sinatra song, and you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna accept a hand me down you know or handout from some entity that you know I don't I don't care enough to believe in kind of thing. So um, you're saying that death was grace here and that he rejected grace. All right, that's fine. No, hey, I will I'll just... I'll say this much. I, I think that the show doesn't know what it's doing with death because yeah. I do think there's a moments where uh, mm. she's painted. All right, we're just going to go. This is going to meld all into like what I dislike about this show. Sure. And um, part of it is like the, the actual script, like the actual story being told. I am not sure what I'm supposed to feel about these characters. And I don't think the script, I don't think the show is being consistent with it. So here's a, mm. here's an honest question for you, Mike is mm. death, Verna, the Raven, whatever Carla Gugino's character. Uh-huh. Is she a good guy or is she a bad guy? She Which just is, is Jacob. She oh, just I is. see. Yeah, she's, yep. she's, she you know what? Is. And that would be a fine answer if you're watching <laughs> like Hellraiser and this is like Pinhead or something like that, who okay. is truly an amoral creation. Mm-hmm. But that's not how the show treats her. The show does not treat Verna as an amoral like character. She, she is too humanized for that mm-hmm. to be the case. In other words, most of the time, you know, the rinse repeat of this show is that uh, Verna, Death, comes to each of the kids as they're dying and like gleefully gives them their comeuppance, right? She's like a mm. spirit of vengeance, basically. Mm. And she's super moralizing, right? Yeah. You know, there's a scene at the end when she's talking to Roderick Usher, the head CEO guy, main character, and mm-hmm. like it starts to rain all the dead bodies that. Um, oh, yeah. You know, she's like, your empire, you've killed millions, you know, millions and millions of dead bodies. Look out and see your empire, see your wealth or whatever she says. And it's just like, it's already storming, but it just starts raining bodies, right? And it's like a cityscape full of just like bodies filling up the buildings and things like that. Mm -hmm. And she's like, look at what you've done to kill all these people. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking to myself, your death. Yeah, like your death, lady. (laughs) Yeah, like why... (laughs) Why are you upset at, or why are you treating him like he's a bad guy? He's done you, know? you a favor. Yeah, yeah, like this is what are you, what? It's so, 
it's so disingenuous. Just, I mean, like, no, I know that's it, because that's what it's like. It wants you to like put these really dramatic phrases yeah. in the character's mouth, but then you're like, wait, in that character, that's what you want him to say? Like, yeah, well, no, and it's like every like when when um his son Frederick dies, he he dies like the pit pendulum. The pendulum. So yeah. like, you know, it, he's getting sliced in half. So, and she's there and she's talking to him. He's like paralyzed and, you know, cause he takes some paralyzed medicine or whatever. Uh, and, uh, she's like, you know, I could have killed you anyway. I could have killed you any way I wanted to. It could have been easy, but then you had to go and do some really nasty things to your wife. And so now we're going to do it this way kind of thing. And it's like, mm. so you're going to d- give him a gruesome, cruel death because he was gruesome and you know evil to his wife so you're you are a spirit of justice you are a spirit of like mm. oh come up or something like that and it's like no you're not no you're not and like y- you don't yeah you do this you, because that's because you're deaf you don't do yeah, it because you're, you're you're not it's like the show wants her wants us to sympathize with her mm. as someone who's bringing justice to these people but and <laughs> At the end of the day, and I think we all kind of see this coming, we all kind of know something like this is what's coming down the pike. Um, she is the reason why everyone's dying to begin with, and not just because she's death, but because that is the pact, that is the deal with the devil that Madeline and Roderick made mm-hmm. back in 1980 or whatever it is that the New Year's, there's a New Year's party. But um, so, so let me get this straight. She comes to Roderick and Madeline and she's like, hey, you guys are on the gravy train towards having all the wealth and power and ambition you ever wanted. You know, classic Satan stuff. Uh, And she's like, you know, I can make sure you get away with it. I can I can remove all obstacles in your path. And one specific thing that brought them to that point, too, because they had actually put themselves on that path. Yeah, because there's not only not only is there the whole like testif- testifying like possibly being a whistleblower and then he throws the guy under the bus thing, mm-hmm. but then also with their boss. So that's well, where you yeah, get they, the uh, the Fortunato thing too. Yeah, Casca Montalado, Montiato, whatever you pronounce it. Um, yeah, famous Edgar Allan Poe story where he bricks up someone gets someone really drunk and then bricks them up in the wine cellar. Um, you know, pretty gruesome stuff. And, you know, it's fun, you know, to go back to positive notes. It is fun. It's kind of like a cheap saw. (laughs) It's kind of like Mm. a light uh, saw where, like, how are they going to take these Edgar Allan Poe stories and turn them into, you know, gruesome deaths for these, like, despicable characters, you know? Mm -hmm. There's there's fun to be had in this show. That being said, I was a little let down by a lot of them. I mean, it's like, okay. So, like, one of them jumps on a bed full of glass and gets like sharded with glass a bunch. And it's like that, that actually sounds like better or worse depending on the perspective I mean, than, than it actually was in the TV show. It was really anticlimactic as far as I'm concerned. Um, but there's the acid raid one. There's the falling off, yeah. the, off the ledge, which I mean, they're also there not just for being gruesome, like you said, like a saw movie, but they're supposed to sort of be fitting in terms of like, just what brought them to that point yeah um you know in a sense there's there's a justice in that they're all supposed to be by their own hand and that's what's so i mean not all of them because then there's the one girl who gets like torn up by the chimpanzee but uh that they're all sort of done kind of either seemingly accidental or by their own hand um is supposed to be kind of the fitting nature of of evil is that it consumes itself, that it kills itself. And that's sort of mm-hmm. the big kind of metaphor for the House of Usher is that it collapsed on itself, right? Which we kind of see the, the That's house true. Doing Listen, I do think end. I do think that is the basic moralizing of this show, right? And mm-hmm. I'm not opposed to a good old fashioned story that talks about how evil eats itself, right? Like I'm sympathetic mm-hmm. to this. I really am. Um by the end of the show, they get really ham fisted. Yeah. with the it's you know the two the super political stuff is yeah like, where it's like you I, know you guys are I evil corporate you know you know well there's blah, blah, that blah. there's also there's a like really great Madeline's soliloquy final soliloquy. yeah <laughs> yeah madeline's <laughs> final soliloquy is <laughs> actually is fantastic like, you... it's a fantastic no it's... i i like that she it's i think what it is is it's um mike flanagan being like i just made an entire eight hour show about how evil people are inherently or rich people are inherently evil and corrupts but I will give the devil its due and allow one person 
to like talk about how the only reason evil people have any power at all is because we give it to them willingly that we are all complicit in buying iPhones, even though we know that they're made by like enslaved children in China, you know, like that, everything she says in that little final moments, I think are actually just truly accurate statements about the people, about anybody who participates in our modern global economy. We have all sold our souls um, for Mm. convenience, right? As people who live in the 21st century. And when Jesus says that it's harder for the rich to get into heaven than a camel is to go through the eye of the needle, we need to think about that. We need to hear what Madeline has to say because we are the rich. That we're, we're you rich are the rich. In terms of I am the human rich. History. Yeah. In terms yeah. of human history, in terms of how we live, in terms of what we ignore, in terms of what we choose to focus on and not focus on, like we are consumers. We are monsters. Myself, uh, this, I'm talking about me. I'm talking so, about all of us. I mean, we've all made a deal with death. With we've with all made now. a deal with the devil. Mad- what Madeline says at the end of the show is 100 percent accurate. Her problem is she's not repentant about it. Her problem mm-hmm. is that she owns it like a like a standard, like uh, a thing of pride. I thought you were going like, to say like a boss, like a boss, <laughs> like a boss, yo. Um, you know, I was like, going to use a different word, but then I'd get in trouble with uh, our benevolent yeah, corporate right. overlords. So, um, <laughs> like a boss, something, yeah. So that's that's so. one thing I I love I love her final soliloquy. I just think um, it's too little, too late for me. And most of the show, it's like, is just about how oh the the corporate people are evil, you know, kind of thing. Um, but here's the, I know that we're wrapping up. We got to wrap up, but here's what mm. I want to go back to. Cause I didn't really finish it. They go into this bar. They make a deal. She's like, I will make sure you get away with killing your boss by breaking them up in the basement. I will make sure you get away with everything for the next 50 years of your lives in exchange for your children in exchange for let the next generation pay for it. Right. Mm-hmm. Which again, this is a, this is a, a huge commentary metaphor, yeah. yeah, on, you know, yeah. let the, let our, the future, whatever. It's an anti-boomer, it's an anti-boomer yeah, it, thing. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's, you know, it's all that stuff. Um, but, it's a big uh, middle finger to the boomers. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but in the immediate context of this show, it's fascinating because basically, and you, you see this scene play out at the final episode, right? So if you mm-hmm. watch the entire show, um, and you've seen that all of these kids are basically were sold to her by their parents out the gates, but she's the one that made the offer, right? Mm-hmm. She's the one that's like, you can have all the power in the world, but I get to kill all of your children and the bloodline of Usher will end with you and your family. Are we cool with that? And the ushers are like, yeah, we're cool with that. You know, partly because they don't even believe it's real. Yeah. But like, you know, there's like, whatever, lady, whatever. And so the rest of the show in which she's sitting there gleefully killing all these bad, you know, all these people like, aha, you got this coming to you. It's like, no, you, they have it coming to them because you set up the dominoes for this. (laughs) Like you did all of this. It's a cooperation. Lady. No, but yeah, you see, the it thing is, is Jacob yeah. is that uh-huh. everybody would have just lived forever if they hadn't, right? Death wouldn't have come for them anyway. They, they all the kids would have just lived forever if they had <laughs> well, not made that Well, and I deal. tell you, isn't that how it works? <laughs> you know, well, no. There's a good. There's a good descendant, right? Lenore. Lenore is like the beautiful flower Juno. Bl- uh, blooming out of the muck. Uh, mm-hmm. Which one was Juno again? That Who was, was the, the one who married Roderick. The last, oh, she's the, oh, yeah. she's sort of like the, yeah, no, the head she's of gold not trope. good though. No, not true. No. She went, she literally went to the uh, party, the Mask of the Red Death party. Remember in the very beginning of the episode, the only, she, or she's basically going to cheat on her husband with uh, presumably her brother in law. No, no, who's not that like one. 20 years not, younger. Not that daughter, not that wife. The wife, the, the wife of the Roderick. one with the leg, the one with the amputated leg. Oh, Juno. That's yes, Juno. The, the, She's the, the one addict. who science who Yeah, the Legadone the addict. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. She's the hooker with the heart of gold trope. Uh, yeah, so. Okay, that's fine. You can have Juno. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, but listen, she goes, and when it comes time for Lenore to die, suddenly 
This isn't like a vengeful death. This is a a watery eyed, sympathetic, like you know. Usually, I she like my comforts job. Comforts her, but, yeah. She but comforts this her time, by telling her all the good yeah. things that will happen. Your life had so much meaning because of what you're going to inspire in people. I just want you to know that you know this job isn't always easy for me. You made this job. You are <laughs> killing this chick because forty years ago you said I get to kill this chick She's in exchange an for you. Reality. She's uh-huh. an elemental reality. She the just movie is. doesn't present her like that. The movie <laughs> or the show doesn't present her like that. Uh, it just wants to have its cake and eat its too, and um, <laughs> it's I, uh, I I don't buy it. Yeah, that's uh, no. We yeah. uh, we agreed. So no, there was definitely <laughs> some, definitely some, like you said, some some very sort of arbitrary choices that were made. Even though, despite, I mean, there were some some cool things too that that are worth appreciating, but. Uh, um, anyway, that's our Edgar Allan Poe slash follow the House of Usher. Let me, uh, I, I know this is super long. And so I want to read the final paragraph of Poe because it's important. It's an episode about Poe. And this is what Poe wanted to do with his work. Go check him out. We'll end with this quote. Is that cool? Very good. Yeah. All right. Good. Here it is, folks. Like and subscribe and all that stuff. But listen to your Uncle Poe. It is no mere appreciation of the beauty before us, but a wild effort to reach the beauty above. Inspired by an ecstatic prescience of the glories beyond the grave, we struggle by multiform combinations among the things and thoughts of time to attain a portion of that loveliness whose very elements, perhaps, appertain to eternity alone. Thanks for listening to Voyage Podcast. The Voyage Podcast is a production of Voyage Comics and Publishing, which seeks to create exceptional entertainment informed by Catholic values that inspire people to live a heroic life. Voyage Comics seeks to advance truth and beauty found in powerful stories. To learn more, visit voyagecomics.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 